Welcome to the video lecture for Chapter 4 in the Intro to Social Welfare course. Today we'll be looking at HIC Chapter 4 and we'll be considering theory and its relationship to social welfare policy and programs in Canada. In this lecture, we'll be looking at four specific theoretical orientations to social welfare. In looking at these particular approaches to social welfare, we are going to consider how these orientations really affect the way in which policy is designed and delivered. We're also going to think about the way in which these particular orientations are taken up by theorists or policymakers who design and deliver particular approaches based on these orientations which are really imbued with political ideology. And this chart gives you just a kind of interesting perspective on how different famous people might position themselves within the political spectrum. These particular political orientations also get expressed through different kinds of policies. Policies or perspectives that relate specifically to the economy, for example, but which we know have an effect on people's social welfare, or perspectives that are applied to social phenomena, things that relate to values and beliefs. And we also know that these approaches affect people's experiences of social welfare. And so the idea of thinking about the political spectrum as a kind of line isn't really a very accurate way of thinking about it. And I think you'll see that in a Canadian context, we often like to combine multiple perspectives to create a kind of middle ground approach to delivering social services. And so I thought that this particular illustration would be helpful in considering how we might see elements of libertarianism, but also elements of authoritarianism in a policy that relates to social welfare. In thinking about this idea of political ideology, the first perspective Hick presents us with is the idea of conservatism. And we know that a conservative orientation is focused on individuality and individualism. Any intervention from the state is seen as a reduction in individual freedom. And so conservatives are sometimes referred to as anti-collectivists. There's definitely an emphasis on economics, on capitalist economic principles, on entrepreneurship, and on an understanding of the individual who succeeds as someone who is biologically and socially predetermined to succeed. You see from this little cartoon that conservatives believe that any intervention is bound to have negative consequences. But we know, based on the fact that we have intervened in the economy and other social forces, that in fact intervention doesn't necessarily spell disaster. It can actually increase well-being and quality of life for people. A liberal orientation to ideology is seen as a more middle ground or moderate position. Liberals believe that the capitalist economic system is beneficial, but that it does leave some casualties in the process of creating wealth for some. So those who are the people who are the casualties of capitalism are seen to be worthy of receiving some kind of benefit and intervention. As a result, liberals believe that it's reasonable to create social programs and policies and that these are provided by the state through a kind of benevolent system. And so some programs should be universal under the liberal orientation, providing services that have a low stigmatization and that are available to all citizens, while other programs and services should target particular populations who may be more significantly harmed by the way we do things. Social work has a close relationship with liberal ideology. In fact, much of the social work value system is built on the ethic of liberal humanism, which suggests that by virtue of being human, all human beings have worth. Because people have worth, they have rights, rights to achieve a good life as they define it. 
Of course, the one question is, who falls into the category of human and who doesn't? Just slightly to the left of the liberal perspective is the social democratic perspective. This perspective still sees a place for capitalism, but that place is a greatly reduced place in the social fabric. Perhaps capitalism is great for creating things like video games or wrapping paper or bicycles, but core elements of society, health care, child care, fuel, housing, are things that should be produced, regulated, and maintained by the collective. In this particular perspective, social welfare programs and services are generally provided as universal programs. Unemployment may be an important part of a capitalist economic system, but under the social democratic system, full employment is the goal. This means that everyone who wants to work has an opportunity to work. Decision making in a social democratic system emphasizes citizen engagement, which means that people would participate in referendums, frequent votes, or town hall meetings to make decisions about how resources should be allocated and other important decisions made. A little further to the left, we have the socialist ideology. This perspective emphasizes absolute collectivism. There's no place for capitalism in a socialist system. The means of production and the distribution of resources are owned by the state. This means that the citizenship of the state are joint owners in all of the systems of manufacturing and distribution. This means that the economy is planned. Production of particular goods and services is planned. It's developed on the base of anticipated needs and the allocation of resources in particular ways. This means we wouldn't make video games and wrapping paper before we made school books and ovens. On this basis, the uh, idea of freedom is directly related to people's economic well-being. This perspective relies heavily on Marxist, per, Marxist theorization, or the work of Karl Marx, and therefore the idea of the proletariat, or the working class, is an important element in understanding who it is that maintains and regulates society. In this context, the idea of freedom is not wrapped up in your ability to do whatever you want or create a new business. It's wrapped up in the idea of your economic well-being. If you know that you have enough, then you can be a more creative and well-rounded person. But this also means that people have responsibilities to others within the society. The socialist ideological principle of each according to their need and each according to their ability means that people have to make sacrifices relating to their own personal desires in order to meet the needs of the whole. The collective here, the whole society, is more important than any individual or any individual desire. What you might have heard in some of this discussion of the political ideologies is the idea that particular levels of control or intervention in a capitalist economic system underpin a lot of the tenets that we emphasize when we talk about the relationship between these political ideologies and social welfare. Money is what makes our capitalist system go around, and so states' capacity to intervene in the economy is an important part of how we administer social welfare in Canada. Because of this reality, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about economic theory. Economic theories are used to create particular approaches to intervening in the economy in order to produce particular outcomes that can be understood as social welfare activities. Canada has long drawn on the wisdom of John Maynard Keynes, or what some people refer to as Keynesian economics.
This particular fix fiscal policy emphasizes the idea that the state should engage in restraint in times of prosperity. So when the economy is working very well, when we're making a lot of money, when people are paying a lot of taxes, governments should save some of that money and not intervene in the economy, but let the economy do its own thing. However, in times of economic shrinkage, recession, depression, the state has a responsibility to stimulate the economy through spending. Keynesian economics believes that the state's role in stimulating the economy can and should include borrowing money if necessary, running debts and deficits if necessary, in order to stimulate the economy. Frequently, we hear stories of the federal government engaging in stimulus activities or providing stimulus packages to particular areas of the country. Stimulus packages, like construction activities, mean that there are higher levels of unemployment, and so people who might have been unemployed as a result of a recession can go back to work. When they go back to work, they pay income tax, and the state is not responsible for paying benefits like employment insurance. And so the money spent on stimulating the economy is to a degree recouped through tax revenue. Another approach to economic management and indirectly to social welfare is monetarist policy or monetary policy. This perspective, which was espoused by Friedman, emphasizes the idea of the supply of money and the relationship of the supply of money to inflation. And when we talk about Inflation can mean that people have less disposable income to spend on other things, like for example vacations or to purchase a home or to purchase a major appliance. Governments have some capacity to stimulate the economy by doing things like controlling interest rates, by perhaps providing subsidies to particular uh, areas of the economy, like say farmers who produce food that becomes groceries, or they can drop the interest rates. Lower interest rates means consumers are more likely to borrow money to make purchases for things like houses or major appliances. And we know right now the economy has produced very low interest rates with mortgage rates sitting at about 2.8% per year on a five-year mortgage, which is kind of a record. But anyway, that's an aside. So governments do have some capacity to control and regulate the amount of money that is circulating in the, in the economy by tinkering with things like the interest rate and by creating possibilities for lowering rates of inflation. A political economy approach reflects some similarities with social democratic principles. Here, the market's concentration of private ownership is drawn into question. And there's seen to be some social benefits to creating um, systems where there's public ownership or collective ownership of particular goods. The point of the capitalist economic system is to generate profit for the owners of the means of production. It's a system that's based on exploitation. But there are a lot of things at the societal level that people need on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it makes sense for the state or the society to provide some of those resources. Where private enterprise is in engaging in the provision of goods and services, collective activities like worker co-ops or cooperative housing programs are seen as a grassroots approach to meeting some of these collective goals. So a number of social welfare programs and services have really embraced this political economy approach challenging the capitalist order, and creating new approaches to delivering collective resources and services. You're going to see in the illustrations that, that I've included in this presentation, two examples of the way in which we might provide services collectively at kind of a very small scale. So for example, in many cities around the world, public bicycle sharing has been developed. You might like to have a bicycle, but a bicycle requires some maintenance and some resources. You might not use it every day. And so sharing a bicycle with other people 
might make a lot of sense. It means more people can have access to bicycles at a lower cost. The public library is another great example of a collective approach to sharing resources. You might need a book, but you might not need to keep the book or own it forever. And so the library allows you to have access to information as a borrower rather than as an owner. Theorists love to develop ways of classifying social phenomena, and the social welfare state is no exception. Hick draws on the work of Titmus and the work of Espling Anderson, who categorized the welfare state. They use ideological principles to engage in a process of classification. They also consider the relationship between public and private involvement, the decommodification of citizens, and processes of reducing or emphasizing inequality within the state as means of understanding the way in which social welfare is delivered and derived within particular systems. Canada's welfare state can be understood as a liberal Anglo-Saxon perspective. We have a hangover from British colonial rule, and so we still draw on a number of the principles of poor law to administer our social welfare system. We provide low levels of benefits that are seen as a disincentive to receiving benefits, an incentive towards work. Benefits are generally time limited, they're needs based, and they're often delivered on an insurance basis. The idea of liberal humanism is still embraced within the, within the perspective of social welfare under this model, but the benefits and services provided by the states are really seen as a kind of last resort approach to providing people with their daily needs. Presently within the Canadian economy, we are embracing what's referred to as neoliberalism, and so we're emphasizing reduction of taxation and an increase in the kind of laissez-faire approach to administering the economy. And so social welfare resources and services are shrinking. And we're sharing this experience with the US, with Australia, the United Kingdom, and Ireland other countries who have relationships, historical relationships, with Britain. Social democratic or Scandinavian approaches to social welfare are romanticized within social welfare communities and within the social work community. These perspectives emphasize high levels of citizen rights, but they have very restrictive concepts of what it means to be a citizen. It's difficult to emigrate and to gain, st to gain status within countries in Scandinavia. However, they do emphasize citizens' rights and universality as the way in which benefits are provided. Citizens within these, uh, these nations pay very high levels of taxes, but they receive excellent services, long benefits for maternity leave, housing supplements, excellent public transportation, excellent health care, lots of job incentive programs, and either free or very reasonably priced post-secondary education. However, there are some challenges within this system, including things like racism and intolerance for people who are unable to operate within the system. So while we may romanticize the social democratic Scandinavian perspective, I'd invite you to investigate a little bit more about it and to not simply see this as the best model possible. European corporatist models emphasize a lot of conservative values and rely significantly on employment as a way of providing people with resources and supports. Within this system, people receive high levels of wages. There's significant regulation around employment and high levels of unionization. This means people are well paid and they have a lot of benefits when they work. But resources and supports for people within society are tied very closely to employment. So people who are unable to participate within the employment system for whatever reason are left out of accessing benefits. There's a very sealed class system and there's little redistribution of income between classes. 
This system also has very rigid definitions of citizenship, and obtaining citizenship as an immigrant is extremely difficult. This parodic cartoon or illustration presents some of the conflicts that exist within this kind of European corporatist model. And while it emphasizes things that are happening in the UK, it does reflect the sentiment. Gender is an important issue within the context of social welfare. You'll see as the course unfolds that women are severely disadvantaged because of traditional roles around women's work and women's unpaid work as caregivers and notions of masculinity and men's role as breadwinners who function outside of the home. Women who have been relegated to work at home have been relegated to unpaid work. As a result, they've not had access to a number of the employment-based resources and supports that are a part of the Canadian social welfare system. This means things like unemployment insurance and the Canada Pension Plan. This means that women can experience poverty as a lifelong condition. Poverty when they're caring for people at home and poverty when they retire because they can't access benefits tied to employment. While we have achieved greater gender equality, we know that women earn about 70 cents for every dollar a man earns. We know that women do significantly more work around the home and provide much more child care and elder care than their male counterparts. So while things have changed and improved, they haven't altogether beca become a situation of equality. Men still earn more in the public world and women still do more work in the private world. However, Government policies and social welfare programs have a role to play in creating change. Governments can encourage a change in behavior by both women and men by implementing particular social programs that encourage particular kinds of behavior. For example, the introduction of leave for male partners and an increase in the access to employment insurance benefits for people who were taking leave to care for children who were either newly born or adopted has meant that being a male child care stay at home child care providing stay at home parent is more possible than it ever has been before the more men do this the more equalization will be created between women and men at at least the social level. But we still have to figure out how we create a real equal pay for work of equal value system in Canada. Because even when we account for women's leaves to care for children or elders, there is still a wage gap that exists between women and men. There's more work to be done. Lots of arguments have been made from the various political ideological perspectives about the cost of social programs and the value that these programs produce. Governments are beginning to reframe the idea of the provision of social welfare services within a kind of social investment framework. Analysis on the potential benefits that are derived from investing in people through social programs are considered economically, and price tags are associated with particular programs and services and with the absence of these services. This perspective has benefits in that it allows us to argue with those people who argue about the cost of social programs but it also monetarizes all elements of society. And perhaps there are some things that we should do just because they're the right thing to do. And the cost of these things perhaps shouldn't be too much of a concern. Social inclusion models are perhaps one of the newest perspectives in social welfare program and service design. 
This perspective emphasizes the benefits associated with ensuring people have access to resources and supports that they need. It also considers the cost of exclusion and the potential losses that a society may experience by virtue of people being excluded from accessing particular kinds of resources and supports. Here we see a same-sex family. These two dads are caring for their son. They're having a nice day at the park. It's not that long ago that this kind of family would have been seen as unusual and for some people as abnormal or immoral. But we can use social welfare policies and programs to encourage acceptance of these kinds of families, meaning that we can re-understand a same-sex two-dad family as a kind of family that benefits society. It's the kind of family that we need. But this sort of change requires a lot of, well, intervention at many different levels. It's not an easy change to create. Rights-based approaches to social welfare policy are another important element in advocating for the maintenance or expansion of services. And many people, including Hick, really embrace, in, pardon me, embrace a rights-based approach. While rights-based approaches have a place, there are other people who argue that rights rely too heavily on the notion of liberal humanism and that this perspective is limited. And that rights-based approaches also require the support of big institutions like the United Nations and other organizations, and they require a kind of consensus on understanding what is a right and what is a responsibility at the social level. We know that healthcare isn't something that everyone sees as a right, but then the Canadian government doesn't see, see water as a right, so I guess we can't, ho ho we can't occupy too much moral high ground. This is the end of this PowerPoint presentation, and so I'll look forward to seeing you at Chapter 5.